It's obvious that if a government wishes to control its people and make sure they do exactly what they're told to do, they have to monitor their people. They have to know what they're doing uh, at all times. We may soon find ourselves living in, in, a, in a nightmare that I think would uh, even George Orwell couldn't have anticipated as to how much control we're putting into the hands of um, you know, government, uh, large corporations, and people that perhaps we can't trust. If you're talking about wars, if you're talking about uh, money management, if you're talking about orchestrating crisis, these people behind it sound like a conspiracy. If you're an average person, you've definitely got a data file on you in the hands of one of the many private companies that uh, compiles data about Americans for, for the business world. Austin, Texas, and in other places around the country, is they're using uh, smart thermostats. And they will, uh, the, the power company actually gives you a thermostat for free, installs it in your home for free, charges you nothing for it, but there's a catch. And the catch is to get this high-tech fancy thermostat, you have to allow them, in the event of uh, you know, excessive power consumption, to reach into your home through radio waves and, and literally turn it off. So one of the basic things about using a computer on the internet is that your communications pass through the networks of various internet service providers, starting with the internet service provider that you are a customer of, and going through possibly several others and then ending up at your destination. And each of those entities, technically, has the ability to look at all your communications and to record all your communications. How'd you sleep? Good. How about you? Coffee's on. Thanks. One of the most alarming trends has been the increased centralization of personal information. I'm a little worried about Kate's cough. She's got a headache, too. She'll be fine. You are buying all sorts of stuff. That means the consumer credit folks will have you. But I will check online to see if anything matches. I guarantee you that many of these other database holders have files on you. You didn't hear her last night? Many, many more entities have wanted to know, well, what kind of a person are you? I wonder if she'll want to eat something. No, nothing here. She's always grumpy in the morning when she wakes up, though. Kind of like somebody else I know. Nice. Well, I gotta get going. Every day in so many ways, we are being watched. We're told that it's for our own good for our own protection, to make our lives better. But is it? I'm Grant Jeffrey, prophecy expert and author of over 26 books. I spent two decades researching and detailing how our fundamental freedoms are being systematically eroded, how our governments are not controlled the way we think they are, and how all of this ties into remarkable prophecies from over 2,000 years ago. Until recently, all of this would have been considered science fiction or the ramblings of conspiracy theorists. But each of the technologies you have just observed either already exists or is being planned on a drawing board somewhere. The evidence is all around us. There is no denying that we live in a surveillance society. And really, no matter what we do, there is no turning back. 
And in the 2010 census, census workers in the United States have actually been sent out in advance, a year in advance of the actual census being taken. They've been sent out with handheld GPS devices and told to go to every single dwelling in the country. Uh, that's an absolutely unprecedented undertaking. It's, it's, it's kind of happened without very much media mention or, or, or much awareness and now have the ability to pinpoint Every, every single location in the country is, is really unprecedented. And it's not just in the United States that they're doing this. We actually found some documentation that this is part of a global effort um, that is uh, being promoted by the UN, by their statistics department. Uh, right now, we're, we're the most surveilled society in, you know, in, in history, obviously. Uh, this, this has gone into high gear. People don't realize that every time they use Google, every time they log on to the search engine, that Google's making a record of everything they search for, linking it to the cookies in their computer, linking it to the, their IP address. But going one step further, Google also reads all of Gmail, all Gmail messages that are sent or received. The reality is that Google is offering you all this bait to bring you in because you're the product. And once they get you in there, then they slice and dice your information and they sell you to the advertiser. And an ad came up, and the ad came up and it said, uh, Kalispell mom loses 37 pounds using some diet aid. Okay, and there's a picture of this mom from Kalispell, Montana. So, you know, great. You know, I have to come home eventually, school starting. I pack up my computer, I bring it home, connect it to my home here near Boston and go back and visit the same web page again. And the ad comes back up, same woman saying, Brookline mom loses 37 pounds using <laughs> such and such diet aid. So of course, you know, they know whether I'm in Brookline or Kalispell because they have to ship the bits one place or the other. In November of 2008, there was um, uh, an effort by Google to, to show that they were able to pinpoint a disease outbreak, a flu outbreak, before the Centers for Disease Control could do that, based on their sophisticated algorithm that they could tell that the person doing those searches had the flu. They were searching for chest congestion or a thermometer or certain types of medication, cold or flu medication. And whenever one of those keywords would be entered into Google, they would, uh, it, it, would, it would set off a red flag. They would pinpoint that person's location based on their internet service provider, and then they would put a red dot on a map. And over time, you would see lots of red dots in certain locations on the map, and then they shared that information with the Centers for Disease Control. And sure enough, they were able to pinpoint those outbreaks two weeks in advance. Now, some people might say, well, gee, that's a really helpful thing to do. But when you log on to Google to look something up, you don't do so with the expectation that Google is going to be capturing your information, studying you, and handing that information over to the federal government. So I think a lot of people found it very, very invasive. And what it raises is the potential for Google or really any other internet uh, service that you use to turn over other sorts of information. You know, who, who, who's concerned about abortion rights or who's a Democrat or who's a Republican or who is, um, you know, who, who has an interest in the Second Amendment? Well, because we don't always know the downstream risk and the downstream harms. There were rumors that a bank had done it to a cancer registry, that they'd taken a cancer registry, crossed it with names that, of people who were in their bank, and then tweaked the credit worthiness of the people if they had cancer. Someday, when all of our products and all other products have, instead of a barcode, have a tiny RFID tag on them, we'll be able to keep track of those products in people's homes. And their proposal was that a smart refrigerator would actually have uh, an RFID reader in the fridge. Every product that you put in the refrigerator, from the milk to the, you know, the, the cream cheese to the hot dogs, would all have an RFID tag in their packaging. And so the refrigerator would actually know its contents. There are plans afoot to actually monitor your garbage, to every time you throw something into the trash can, the trash can would actually be equipped with an RFID reader and would monitor, are you throwing it into the right trash can? Is this a recyclable item that you're throwing into regular household trash? Um, how long did it take you to consume that item? How long was it in your home before you threw it away? The idea that we would be at a point where everyone would be watching every move and it would be tied into the television, we'd have personalized advertising, we would have uh, HMOs, for example, your, your, your health insurer, keeping tabs on 
you know, who is eating the Haagen Dazs and, and how much green leafy vegetables is this family consuming because they're literally monitoring what happens in, in your house through your refrigerator. You know, some would say it opens up great opportunities to improve public health. Uh, other people would say, well, it opens up super, oppor I mean, you know, horrifying opportunities for Big Brother to be right there in your refrigerator and sitting at your dinner table with you. With rising technology and uh, with the, the motivating forces from the government level to push that technology in the direction of capability of monitoring human activity. Uh, with that technology emerging, it's very frightening because it means that totalitarian regimes will very soon indeed have the power to control and monitor every human being on the planet. People working in major office buildings have a, a, an access pass, you know, a badge that they use to get into their office. Every time you scan that to get into the building, you're revealing what time you got there, what time you left. Uh, those records have actually been used by employers to determine whether someone was claiming sick leave when they weren't really sick. The reasons for surveillance and the need for better surveillance systems are compelling. If you want to keep track of your pets or children, livestock or possessions, you can now put ID tracking devices on them. If you want to make sure employees are working the way they should, you can now monitor them. If you want to protect citizens from thieves, con artists, drug dealers, hate mongers, pedophiles, terrorists, and basically anyone and everyone who's a threat to society, you can now track, monitor, and scrutinize them. If you can save lives and protect property, why wouldn't you? And if you yourself are engaged in unsocial or illegal actions, your rights to privacy should be taken away. Those are compelling arguments. But is it right? And are only the bad guys being watched? Hey, honey. What's up? What was that tonight? Oh, um, well, we need to be there. Yeah, I'll try and get home early. All right, love you. Bye-bye. Whenever people say, if, if you aren't doing anything wrong, why do you care if people watch you? I, I kind of turned that around and I said, well, if I'm not doing anything wrong, then you have no business watching me. President Bush, um, Attorney General Gonzalez, um, and uh, the head of the NSA, uh, all admitted that, well, the Times was right, that uh, the NSA had been spying on Americans without the warrant required by law, required by the Constitution, and required by federal wiretapping law, uh, and that they had been doing this uh, for a number of years. There used to be a joke, you know, we're from the NSA, we read your email so that you don't have to. All of our phone calls are now processed essentially by computers in a digital form. And so wiretapping a phone call is just a matter of telling some of those devices to remember or to divert some of those bits rather than necessarily physically clipping anything onto anything. So as you can imagine, it's very cheap and very straightforward. You know, when I turn it on to make a call and then I'm going to shut it off, and I'm, it's just like the old handset telephone that I have in my house, except I can walk around with it. Well, it isn't, because first of all, when you have it on, it's constantly telling the telephone company where you are. Notifies the nearby cell phone towers, whether you're talking on it or not, of what your location is, because that's how the phone company knows where to route your incoming calls. It, it doesn't try every cell phone tower in the world. It has a constantly updated record of where the telephone is, and that data is stored and it can be used somehow. The thing is a location device as well as a communication device. Well, fine, but I'm going to leave it off all the time. Well, you know, it's really not a telephone. It's really a computer connected to a radio transmitter and receiver and a microphone and loudspeaker. And the computer can make the radio transmitter and receiver and microphone and loudspeaker act kind of the way a telephone does, but it can make it do all kinds of other things as well. These devices can actually be used by appropriately authorized 
government officials to turn the cell phone into a kind of roving bug. So that when you press the power button and you think you're turning the telephone off, you're actually turning the microphone on and the radio transmitter on so that the conversation, whatever noise is ambient around where the telephone is, is being sent back to FBI headquarters or wherever. A knife is a, is a piece of technology. Now a knife used in a bar fight to carve somebody up is a terrible thing. That same knife to do, perform an emergency appendectomy and save someone's life is a very good thing and without it you couldn't have saved that person's life. The knife itself is neither good nor evil, it's just a knife. This is how technology works. In addition to the big brother phenomenon, which is definitely out there, there's all of this little brotherism. You know, there are the, the teenagers with the cell phones who take embarrassing pictures of themselves, of their friends, and so on. And they said, did you ever lose your cell phone? He said, oh yeah, I lose the cell phone. About three or four times I lost the cell phones. Do the pictures come back to the cell phone? Well, yeah, the pictures come back to the cell phone. Where do the pictures come back to the cell phone from? You know, there's an agency out there, you know, that actually has a copy of everything on our on your cell phone, which is a fine thing if you lose your cell phone. It's good that you can get all of your data back. But again, you know, that information could be available under a court order to uh, someone who'd filed a civil suit against you. This is the example of ourselves being our own worst enemies. One condition for employment for a lot of major corporations is that in your employment contract, there's actually a clause that allows your employer to monitor what you do on the computer. And if I want to log on to a website or, or you know, maybe check on the, the political returns or whatever it might be, that, that's something, gee, I've got a 15 minute break, why not? and to discover later that your employer was doing that, maybe making judgments on you on the basis of your, your politics or on the basis of your interests, um, really could be, uh, you know, could, could get people in trouble, and it has. Invention of the electronic uh, swipe lock, uh, where you, they would give you a card which could re be reprogrammed, so you know, once you checked out, it could no longer be used to open the same door, was a great security improvement. They're lighter than keys, of course, a complete record of every, to the second, every time you go into your room is being logged somewhere. And, uh, you know, if you go into the gym in the morning, they know when you went into the gym. Uh, if you go in the back door of the hotel after the door gets locked, you know, that's being logged as well. And this is, you know, very useful information for forensic purposes. But does any of us know whether this information is being exploited commercially for, for any reason. You know, are they correlating my, let's say, record of whether I go into the gym with whether I had a three fried egg breakfast in the morning, which they also have because we use the same, <laughs> I eat in the hotel dining hall in the morning and they use the same record to bill me for both the room and my meal. So what happens to the information? How does it get correlated? Who does it get shared with? Somehow the various national banks and the various counterfeit investigative entities convinced this Printer Industry Association that it would be in their interest to include a tracking mechanism in all color laser printers that they sold. And the, the basic mechanism that's generally been used is patterns of very tiny yellow dots. The arrangement of the yellow dots encodes in some way or another the serial number of the printer that produced the document. So if you have any document that was printed on a color laser printer and the appropriate knowledge, you can reconstruct which printer out of all the color laser printers in the world produced that document. And the same technology is also included in color photocopiers. There's a couple of um, initiatives to monitor whether or not people wash their hands when they go into the bathroom. And they, they operate by using the access pa pass or the, the ID badge that an employee would have that read the tag, that determine whether or not you use the soap dispenser, whether or not you turned on the sink, and actually monitor you in, I think, the most private of all locations. You would have these people monitoring every single breath you take. I mean, there's got to be a point at which you say, you know, some things are private, and uh, you know, we're, we're, we're all adults here, and we are responsible, and, and if you're employing me, you need to have some degree of trust. 
and not be prying into my personal business. Almost everything you do is tracked. It's uh, everything you buy is tracked. My car is equipped with OnStar. Uh, you know, they know where I am at, at, at any second. I can push a little button in my mirror and they'll tell me precisely where I am. Uh, you know, some of this stuff is good, some of it's bad. If I was a car thief, it would be bad because OnStar can also turn the car off while I'm in the process of stealing it. So in the communication surveillance area, uh, what we're talking about is systems that, uh, or programs to try to keep track of what people are saying on the phone, surveillance of what people send in an email, surveillance of the records of who you talk to, when you talk to them, and for how long. Then on the other side, with location surveillance, we very much into systems that track where you go in everyday life. And this is a, a really a growing area of concern for the uh, You get that with the growth of public video surveillance cameras that actually watch you and record your images uh, while you're in public places or in shopping malls or pretty much anywhere. That also comes about from, say, uh, GPS devices, which uh, can allow you to be tracked. Uh, cell phone technology can allow you to be tracked. And then finally, of course, uh, RFID tags, which can allow you to be tracked. So you have a lot of different modalities of location surveillance that are all of great interest both to the uh, the government and also to commercial marketers. It's almost impossible really to live off the grid. You have to live without credit cards. You have to live without bank accounts. It's hard to go in and out of the country. You know, one of the areas about which I've been alarmed is the kind of information you have to give up at the border when you go in and out. If you carry a computer with you, U.S. border security asserts the right to inspect what's on your computer in the same way they can inspect what's in your suitcase. And since our whole lives now, many of us are on our laptops, pretty much everything professional and personal about us is, you know, is there. So we've seen in, uh, certainly, that the FBI, uh, they are customers of Choice Point. They will call up data about people from Choice Point and they say, well, if any merchant can use Choice Point, why can't we? So it's a, a very, very promiscuous world when it comes to uh, data about us because both the government wants to know about us and private businesses want to know about us. And uh, when they gang up on everyday people, it's really quite an unholy alliance. comes to 375. Thanks. Just retry. Uh, let's try one more time. Um, I'm sorry, sir, this card doesn't seem to be working. Um, one second, please. Hello? The Eden Run, that's right. Uh, yes, I've just been trying it. It's um, uh, Mr. John Wilson. Uh, yeah, he's right here. It's for you. Hello? Oh, uh, yeah, uh, just regular things, gas, groceries, coffee. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, okay, bye. Seems that guy a couple of states over has been using my card. Too bad I can't uh, keep the plasma screen TV and motorcycle. That's too bad. Any of us can think of the things that we normally purchase on our credit card and the convenience at which it is to use a credit card and how much of your daily life is actually visible through your credit card statement is pretty amazing, right? So I, I could see patterns of, of use, patterns of behavior. I can uh, know things about the kind of person you might be, the kind of lifestyle you might live, um, the, uh, uh, your spending habits. Do you tend to spend a lot at the beginning? Of, if you're paid monthly, do you spend a lot at the beginning of the month and very little at the end? Many young people barely 
know what cash looks like. They use credit cards for anything. Many of us do. I shouldn't say young people. It's true for me as well. Use credit cards for everything because there are incentives to do it. But they're great data collection tools. We give up lots of information about ourselves. It is the only anonymous way to, uh, to, con to conduct any kind of business. The problem with cash is it's rapidly becoming an anachronism. If you don't think so, take $10,000 and go and try and put it down in cash on a new car. But by the time you get the paper signed, you'll be sitting with two FBI agents wanting to know where the $10,000 came from. Because if you transferring more than $10,000 can be a crime. Now, that means that now cash isn't that anonymous except in smaller amounts. And how small is a smaller amount? It, it, you know, you can, there, there are things that uh, you can buy for $20 or $30, but if you go any higher than that, uh, you know, if you bring $100 bills, most stores won't take them. There is a desire by, many, by several forces coming together who do want to add a biometric identifier to um, government identification. So the, the, leading, the leading push in the United States is most likely a biometric added to your driver's license. That biometric is most likely going to be a fingerprint. Under that model, the fingerprint becomes your new social security number. So what does that mean? I'm touching the chair, I'm touching the table, I'm leaving my fingerprints behind. You come along with a piece of tape and some dust, you pick up my print, you stick it on a, a, a fake ID, and now you're me, <laughs> right? As proved by this phony fingerprint that you've just lifted up, right? And then if, if things get really bad with your identity theft and social security numbers, you can actually get a new social security number. But what do I do about getting new fingerprints? I'm always forgetting my wallet. <laughs> and then I can't find it and I don't know where it is. And the idea that maybe someone could put an RFID chip somewhere where I would just have to wave my arm, it's a very attractive proposition. There are plenty of reasons, I think, to be worried about a cashless society where we have microchips implanted in our hands and simply make our payments in that way. Uh, for one thing, you would be unable to ever make a payment or make a purchase that someone wasn't watching and recording in a database. Marketers would love to get a hold of that. Hackers can hack into that. The government could use it um, you know, to, to, to investigate you or try to control your behavior. Nobody ever reads those disclosure requirements. Um, no one. No one, no one, no one. <laughs> so I, you know, I, I, every year when I teach this uh, material at Harvard, I ask my, you know, big class, um, you know, who has a Facebook account? And every hand goes up. I said, how many of you read the, you know, what you were agreeing to before you click the I agree button on your Facebook account? Never, never a single hand. These are Harvard students. If anybody's going to read the fine print, you hope it's going to be Harvard students. They don't, nobody does. So a lot of the time, even when there are protections about sharing of data, we really have no awareness of how far they go. Data can be shared between commercial business partners, and there are sharing that also happens between uh, government agencies and the private sector. But I think even more serious is if a purchase requires that kind of a hand stamp, then if you become a non-person, for whatever reason, someone decides they don't, they don't like your, your political views, they don't like uh, the, the activism, they don't like the fact that you campaigned against the current president in the last election cycle, then you go to press your hand to the reader and it says reject it. Sorry, you don't count. We, we, we won't allow you to participate. Um, Hitler actually did that back at the, the early part of his um, era of, of terror and control over Germany, actually determined uh, certain things that Jews wouldn't be allowed to do, set certain streets that they couldn't walk down, that they were not allowed to enter, um, even set certain restrictions on what they could buy at the store. Understand, you know, how money works and how the only real way right now we have of hurting them is through money, which is one of the reasons they're trying to create cashless society. Because as long as you and I have cash, we can eat. And as long as we can eat, we're free, at least we can defend ourselves. When you take the cash away and you create credit cards and then you create microchips, what you're doing is suddenly, you know, we become the whim of the powerful people. They can punish us by pressing delete three times on the computer screen. Suddenly $10,000 turns into $10. One of the most important developments in the, this privacy area that's come with the digital revolution is that Orwell's picture of loss of privacy, the government watching us, the surveillance cameras everywhere, certainly is true to some degree. There are surveillance cameras everywhere.
That's hilarious. Where do you get all this stuff? I don't know how I lived before YouTube. What, you just search all day? No. Painful or stupid is easy to find. Useful and factual take a while. Employers, law enforcement agencies, stores, insurance and credit companies, hospitals, and the government would all argue that their surveillance is necessary. They'd also all state that individual surveillance and data systems are not invasive and pose no threat of creating personal profiles or a data shadow. Simply stated, one source of surveillance at one location on one part of a person's life is not a real concern. But if all this disparate information is gathered and sorted and filed in a central location, it would create a complete and detailed profile, much more invasive than anything even a police check could get. The infringement on individuals' personal freedoms and the possibilities for abuse would rival George Orwell's big brother government. If you go through your life, some, almost most of the time, some computer somewhere is recording something about you. And, uh, and so if you think about it, it's just, you know, tons of information on each of us. And then there are certain efforts of some kinds of data that are put together uh, to build profiles and so forth. So this is a lot of data. This is a huge explosion of data being collected on individuals. One of the things that people often say is, you know, well, you know, who's going to be watching me all day long? Who has the resources or the time to watch me? And, and the answer is really no one is going to be sitting there watching everybody. There's, there's not enough resources for that. But the computers can do it. Now that we have almost unlimited storage capacity on computer hard drives, it's possible to record everything that happens in front of a video camera or every transaction that occurs, um, you know, in a credit card database, for example. And uh, that, that information is actually becoming um, immense. It was revealed in the New York Times that Walmart's database was as big as, if not bigger, than the entire internet. After 9-11, a lot of the failures to prevent the attacks were attributed, rightly or wrongly, to the failure of different government agencies to share data with each other to form a complete picture that would have identified the terrorists before they got on the airplane. And so those walls between government agencies are coming down. And then it turns out in the, you know, in the U.S. there's data the government is prohibited from collecting itself, but which it can perfectly well go buy on the open market from private vendors. Even, you know, where there are walls that are supposed to keep the data separate, they come down. I mean, just pretty much across the board, this is ongoing demand for linking more and more of the information on individuals. Um, you know, what do you purchase at the credit card versus what your telephone set, where your telephone says you are now? Is this an opportunity to send you a text message and tell you, remind you to go to the grocery store that they have a sale on orange juice? <laughs> I mean, this is the kind of vision that many people have, and there's been a lot of effort moving towards that vision. In a computerized age where um, information doesn't vanish into the air, but is always being recorded somewhere uh, and then collected aggregated into a database is that every purchase you make, um, every step you take where there's a public video surveillance camera, um, you know, when you use a credit card, uh, the searches you do on Google, all these things get, uh, get collected. And the way the law looks at it right now is, well, you typed in that search term to Google. So you knew they were going to get it. Of course they have the uh, ability to keep it. And because as a practical matter, uh, we have this giant information collecting system, um, you know, the threat to privacy uh, today is far, far greater than it ever has been. It's more like the creation of an encyclopedia. And if you think about an encyclopedia, you know, back in the old days when, when, when you had A through Z encyclopedias, you wouldn't sit down and read every single volume. But when you wanted to look up Amazonian tree frogs or the country of, you know, Colombia, it was right there at your fingertips. And so I think what, what's happening with the database is the best way to understand it is that you are just a blip on the screen right now. But the moment someone wants to look you up, and wants to drill down and find out about you, they open up your entry. And at that point, all of this data that's been collected really would paint a, a shockingly detailed in, uh, paint picture of a single person's life. When Big Brother is government, um, 
the co what are the consequences? Well, the well, government can take away my liberty. You know, if Big Brother is industry, maybe my finance, my credit card company or my bank, well, they could just throw up my credit worthiness. They might take my money. So liberty, so the consequences of who the Big Brother is are non-trivial. If there had been other attacks and more liberty, more pressure was put on, you know, more privacy sort of put at risk, um, the consequences for Big Brother could have been really large. Because what if more and more Americans were caught up in a dragnet, more and more innocent Americans caught up in a dragnet, believed to be terrorists, might be terrorists, we're just scared of you kind of thing. Um, you know, those consequences are really extreme. There's a push for every nation on the globe to identify and number all of its citizens. We're seeing this happening in China, where you've got over a billion people that have now been issued unique ID cards, literally uh, national ID cards with uh, radio frequency devices in them that can be used to track them and identify them at a distance. You're seeing now it's happening in Mexico. They're going to be doing national ID cards to all of the citizens in Mexico. 1.2 billion people in India about to go into a database, uh, virtually every country on the globe. You know, I go to the doctor, I have a lab test done, my blood is there, uh, they sequence it, they know something about me, but they also know something about my family. And even if I agree that they could use it for research, to what extent did I now bring my family, release information about them? This is an RFID credit card. Um, there, there have been tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions, of these issued, and the vast majority of people who are carrying them don't actually realize that there is RFID in them. There's nothing on it anywhere that says RFID. There's a small symbol on the back that if you know what it means, you'd know that it was RFID, but if you're just looking at it, it's just another logo. You, you have no way of knowing that there is an RFID chip in it. The problem with this is that because you don't know there's RFID in it, you won't take any steps to protect it, which means that I can come along with a device like this. I bought this on eBay for about $200, and it reads these RFID credit cards. It gives me full card information that is sufficient to, to process a credit card transaction. So using my $200 device, I've got all of these people walking around with all of these credit cards in their pockets that they don't know have RFID and that they don't know are vulnerable to off-the-shelf devices like this that can read their credit card information and then conduct transactions with their credit card without that card ever leaving your wallet. What kind of questions could someone ask about you uh, that would be answered by a database that kept track of where you were? You know? You know, why did you visit that person's house? Well, gee, we know that that person was holding a, uh, a meeting of the Communist Party. Or, you know, gee, you go to this place every Wednesday at noon. Well, it's easy to find out that that's a church and there's an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. There's just a, a million ways that simply knowing where someone is um, on a regular sort of basis allows you a tremendous amount of information. I believe uh, the American people, and indeed the people of the world, are in that same position. We've got a couple of little tiny glimmers that there's something wrong, that there are databases being collected. But what my research for the last 10 years has been about is trying to identify the bulk of that iceberg floating under the water so we don't hit it. There is no question that we are being monitored all the time, all of us. That's not science fiction, that's fact. But who is controlling the information? Who's watching the watchers? If you live in a free and democratic nation, you may rest easier knowing that totalitarian regime won't come knocking on your door. But journalists, Christians, aid workers, and many others around the world in places like China, North Korea, and the Sudan are not as fortunate. They're routinely abused, arrested, tortured, and even killed for their seemingly innocent and innocuous actions. The people in Hitler's Germany and in Ceausescu's Romania never thought their freedoms could be squashed or that they themselves could be seen as a threat. Could such a thing happen in other nations or here in America? Surely our information is safe with our elected officials and we're protected by our constitutional rights. If everyday citizens don't stand up for their rights, 
then a big government will take more and more of their rights away from them. Everyone should be concerned about this because this affects them, it affects us. None of us uh, are exempted from what's happening in the world today. This affects our lives, our children's lives, our grandchildren's lives. And if we really care about anything, anybody outside of our own skin, if we really care about other people, about society, about our nation, about the world, we'd better take an interest in what's going on. So if your phone calls, your letters, um, if the contents of your homes, um, the contents of your automobiles, the contents of your computers are open to surveillance by the government or by uh, private entities who share that information with the government, then I think it's going to be very, very hard for most people to be free in the way they live their lives. If we get to the point where the government is watching everything we do, then we're going to see some serious erosions of our civil liberties, our right to assemble peaceably, our right to free speech, our right to free religion, uh, free practice of, of the religion of our choice. All of these rights are going to be eroded through these technologies. The saying is, if you put a frog in cold water and then you put the heat on, the frog will gradually warm up so he won't know to jump out and he'll be boiled to death because it's such a gradual Thing. Now, I don't know if it's true with the frog, but I can pretty much tell you it's true with the population because I'm watching it happen. We're at a situation now where uh, technology keeps clashing with privacy and society keeps ending up in this leave it, take it or leave it situation. And what we really want is for society to enjoy the benefits of the technology as well as have privacy. The ability for Google to, to uh, tell everything about you and the house you live in, uh, the ability to watch you on the street, uh, to monitor you. I can understand the reasons for Great Britain setting up the, chi the camera spy systems that they've set up, but it, if used incorrectly, it, it can destroy you. And of course, computers are another thing that, that governments want to control. And they have the ability to do that in, the so in, in communist China. You cannot use a computer with the government knowing what you're saying and who you're saying it to and what you're up to. Founders of this country understood that, sure, there were bad guys, um, but they also understood that if you give the executive branch, uh, if you give the government sort of arbitrary, uh, unbridled, unchecked power to search and to seize, then you are really inviting tyranny and the abuse of power. The America that stood for liberty and personal freedom that, that peaked probably in the 50s and 60s no longer exists. Uh, most of us have, uh, have taken comfort in, in the law of a, con you know, a constitutional protection, and that's out the window. There's, we no longer are governed by the Constitution, much as though people think they are, but that's, that's been shredded and, and no longer operative. There is a faction within the country that believes the Constitution's a living document, and because it's a living document, presumably you can torture it until, you, until it says whatever you want it to. The truth of the matter, that's leading to a socialist environment and will ultimately lead to tyranny. And so uh, that's, to those that love freedom, it's the end of an era. Uh, the, great, the great experiment that was once America has been prostituted by, spe by special interests. The environment is the cover for the real objective of sustainable development, which is to change our system of justice and change our system of economics to a system of social justice. You can talk to most judges in America today, and they will proclaim themselves to be agents of social justice. Well, there's no concept of private property in a system of social justice. So what is being done is our, our, our whole foundation for the American experiment is being undermined with this environmental move. You know, we all want to promote those good causes, but the real question is, how much bang are you really getting for the buck? Are we really making a difference, or are they just trying to get more surveillance power? Uh, you're going to see in, in, increasing encroachments on freedom of speech, um, and take some, <clears throat> that takes some interesting colorations. Uh, in the press, you can say what you like about uh, against Christianity, no problem. But you say a peep against Islam, and you get clobbered. In our schools, 
They'll teach Islam, but you're not allowed to teach the Bible. This is a unique political experience in all of human history, and, and, and the future of humanity really depends upon the political recognition of every individual's unalienable rights. And that's what's wafting away. Increasingly, in the name of fighting illegal immigration, there, there are arguments that daily activities, basic activities that are required for just living, should require an ID card. Whether it's uh, getting a job, whether it's renting an apartment, whether it's visiting a doctor, and ultimately I think it's whether it's going to a store and actually buying food. And so you see kind of the writing on the wall. Right now there's an employment database um, held by the federal government that uh, they want all employers to run every single person applying for a job past this database to make sure that they have legal status in the country. For many years I've been concerned about the long-term likelihood of a free world for my grandchildren and my children. And now I'm very worried about it for myself because things are accelerating so fast. One of the big concerns that I have is if you get to the point where everybody's carrying RFID tagged items, whether it's a driver's license, whether it's a tag in your jacket, whatever it might be, then all it would take for the government in order to round people up or put people on a watch list, they could just put an RFID reader in a backpack, they could blend in with the crowd, mill back and forth, walk among the, the, the protesters or the gatherers or the people in the church or the mosque or wherever it might be, and automatically download and capture all of their information, upload it to a huge database and say, oh, these were all the people who were seen at the peace rally or these were all the people seen at the uh, Democratic National Convention, whatever it might be. I think surveillance and and tyranny or surveillance and the loss of freedom really go hand in hand when you look at other civilizations, other societies over the years, you know, all the way up into you know, the 20th century. There's this really strong link between autocratic or despotic or excessive government power and at the same time all sorts of surveillance mechanisms, whether they're secret police or national ID cards or other kinds of mechanisms that are designed to make sure that people are being watched and perhaps even more insidious, that they know they're being watched. Won't all this surveillance and technology make us safer from crime? Won't, isn't it a good idea to watch everybody and monitor what they do? If that were the case, then you should be able to look back and say, okay, well, let's look at the most monitored and surveilled people in history. And arguably, that was the Soviets living under the Soviet Union under Stalin and uh, the, the folks who came after that. Every phone call could be listened to. Every piece of postal mail could be opened. If you had a, a party at your house, you wouldn't know if government informants were attending the party listening. You know, after all, if you have nothing to hide, why would you care? But the Soviet Union under Stalin was the most deadly regime in all of history. And in fact, under that regime, with all of that watching, 60 million people perished. 60 million people were killed by their own government, by the very government that was supposed to be protecting them. You know, the bad guy might today be Al-Qaeda and it might tomorrow be, you know, fundamentalist Baptist. Uh, you take Homeland Security who issued a report that said those people who own guns, those people who are anti-abortion, those people who are the tax protesters uh, and all kinds of Americans are really terrorists in waiting. And attempts should be made to silence those people. The MIAC report, which was the Missouri Information Awareness Center, it was a report put out for law enforcement that was actually leaked into the public sphere. And it was defining potential domestic terrorists. And disturbingly, this MIAC report was listing people who could be your next door neighbor, even you. They were, they were listing people who, um, you know, anybody who was concerned about constitutional issues, anybody who uh, supported Chuck Baldwin or Ron Paul, you know, anybody who was a libertarian or a constitutionalist, so people with, um, you know, who weren't just mainstream Republican Democrats, anyone who was concerned, the part that shocked me, anyone who was concerned about RFID privacy. You know, so that's, that's, that's me, that's what I work on, and I'm certainly not a domestic terrorist. Uh, people who were concerned about abortion and, and issues around that, people who were uh, wanting to defend their Second Amendment rights, which are constitutionally protected, your right to, to own and bear arms. You know, all of those people were identified as potential domestic terrorists, and in this report that was going out to law enforcement, they were being told to, to watch out for us, to look for people who share those characteristics. How much 
additional security do you get by having so much less privacy? It is a really fundamental question. And it is always easy to say, you know, I don't care. Uh, I want the government to know everything. Just keep the bad guys away. Keep the terrorists away. Our history tends to demonstrate that governments uh, repurpose information. They get information for one purpose, and they use it for something else. The unchecked surveillance tends in the long run to cost us more than the security that we gain from it. Well, I'd like to know how they define the bad guys. You see, um, the, uh, in Germany, that was true too. The bad guys there were Jews, and they murdered six million of them. By whose authority? Well, that's the common good. That was, that was the state decision. You know, the whole concept of master race. All those ideas were uh, given the color of law. You see, the way you persecute a people is find out what they do, disparage it, marginalize them, and then and then pass laws against what they do, and then enforce the laws. When it came out that the government and the Census Bureau was collecting the GPS coordinates of everyone's front doors, a lot of us said, why would you need that? You have the street address. You clearly know how to find the location, or the census worker couldn't have gotten there in the first place. So why would you need this extra step that's costing an enormous sum of money? The only explanation that could occur to, to many of us is that they'd want to know the GPS coordinates of your house so that they could target you. And that sounds crazy, but when you look over at what's happening in, in Pakistan and in Afghanistan, where uh, there are unmanned aerial drones that can literally target a home, um, we, we regularly hear about houses that have been blown up by the military. Um, you know, there was a wedding party going on in this house, and then boom, um, you know, bombs were dropped on it, and, and it was blown up. So I think there's a real um, question mark. Now it becomes a question of whether or not you trust the government. The problem with governments is they're made up of people. If you didn't have people in them, they'd probably be okay. But you know, as soon as you give a guy a little bit of power, well, you know, that's never quite enough. It becomes his mandate, it's his human natural instinct to accumulate more power. One of the problems when you create these technologies is, is it's like putting a noose around your neck. And you may think, well, gosh, it's, it's someone I really trust, and, and, you know, where's the danger? But then that person you trust goes away, and then someone else can rise to power. We've seen it happen all over the globe. We've seen it happen century after century, where evil people have this bizarre tendency to rise into positions of power and authority over others. You know, you look at what, uh, what Hitler was able to do with, with very limited technology. He was able to pinpoint, single, and destroy, um, you know, large numbers of people that he just personally decided he didn't like. That capability that he had back in the 1940s, I mean, multiply that exponentially in terms of what could be done today. You could, um, you know, turn people in, into non-entities. Uh, you, you, you wouldn't even have to kill them. You could just make it so they couldn't access the ATM machine, they couldn't go to the grocery store, they couldn't get to the, see the doctor. So the, I think the bigger picture and what we need to be thinking of as a society today is we really should not be creating the power to destroy our lives and, and putting it into anyone's hands. You know, whether you trust the current administration or not is, is really irrelevant because ultimately I believe there will be someone who will come along and who will take advantage of that. They'll remove all the safeguards we put in place and then we're just going to be sitting ducks. One of the founding fathers said, you know, those who would trade liberty for security deserve neither. Hello, John Wilson speaking. Okay, why do I have to come down? Sounds a bit strange. No offense, but I don't know anything about you. Yeah, sure, that would help. Okay, uh, what's the address? Okay, how long is this gonna take? I understand, okay, bye. What's going on, an emergency prayer meeting? No. A division of Homeland Security wants to ask me some questions. Come on, you? Yeah. Hey, this isn't one of your jokes, is it, Barry? No, man. Wish I'd thought of it, though. Huh. Hilarious. Relax. Buddy, this is the U.S. After this is over, you'll be able to sue them for emotional trauma and wasting your time. What most people don't realize is that for hundreds of years, 
thousands of extremely wealthy, powerful, and connected people have been working to create a one-world government. Many of these people are Americans. Most have all the best intentions in the world, and many are in positions of power right now. With every passing year, with every new crisis, the reality of America not being in control of its own destiny comes closer and closer. I believe all of us should be concerned about world government, especially if you understand uh, those who are at the forefront pushing this agenda. Um, if this comes in, I don't believe that it will be a democratic world government, although uh, some of the organizations pushing this agenda are trying to make that case right now. I believe it would be a highly centralized world government where if you disagree with those in authority, uh, you have no option but to go along. Uh, those who uh, disagree with them would be persecuted. There is no doubt in my mind. We would lose, lose our freedom of speech. We, we would lose our freedom of worship and any other freedom you can imagine unless you are willing to come under their authority. They believe that freedom is not a good thing in the world today. They really believe that. They think that freedom leads to anarchy, it leads to uh, non-unity, it leads to inefficiencies and so forth. And of course it leads to challenge of their own uh, rule. And so they really want to bring all of mankind into some kind of a regimen. We are at the point in history right now uh, where two groups of people, those who believe in the good of humanity uh, and who stand for justice, and the other side who for the last 800 years have been trying to destroy uh, the very semblance of what society really means and you know the in in in, in the concept of of, of humanity and uh, we're at the point right now in history where there's no second choices third ways or fourth opportunities is it's a time where everybody has to make a moral decision whether to defend truth justice freedom and basically the planet or take up the uh, point of view of the other side which is the destruction of nation state republics and uh, the destruction of life on this planet there are several different organizations that um have risen to the forefront, uh, depending on whether they are putting, pushing the political, the economic, or the spiritual aspects of, of the One World Movement. Um, and within those organizations, I'm speaking of uh, the United Nations, uh, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Bilderberg Organization, and others. Um, there are those, even in the current administration, uh, who have this type of, of view of the world that they want to move the United States and Western society in the direction of globalization and world government. If you tear down the barriers between the countries of the world and there is this, I call it mafia, this powerful mafia above the countries of the world, they are coming down through sustainable development in the United Nations and all kinds of control to take the soul of the world. I have covered 105 global meetings. I've interviewed presidents and prime ministers. I've read tens of thousands of pages of their documents. This is not fiction. This is fact. A lot of these societies and organizations working together, but it's not only the secret societies that work together. Uh, the reason they're so powerful, so difficult to destroy is that they have politicians on their side who are tapped into the societies. You have uh, members of Congress of Parliament, you have the banking representatives, you have the royalty, you have the newspapers who of course form part of, of this elite and are sworn to secrecy. And then of course you have uh, uh, NGOs, non-governmental organizations are also tapped into this because again, you control all these organizations through money. When I first understood and saw world government at my first global meeting in 1994, first I was shocked. I was amazed. Why wasn't anybody talking about it? Why wasn't anybody doing anything to protect the sovereignty of the United States? And if we look at the source of these problems, we find here, at least in the United States, we find a relatively small group of people. It's called the Council on Foreign Relations. The CFR is not very well known to the average American, but in reality, it is our hidden government. Because if you look at all of the real important positions and the power centers of society, and by that I mean the leadership positions in government, the president, the vice president, the secretary of state, the, the secretary of defense, the head of the CIA, and so forth, uh, even Supreme Court justices and senators, but the, the ones at the very top of the political power structure. And then you look at those who are 
the dominant within the media centers, the heads of the uh, networks, ABC, CBS, NBC, Turner Broadcasting, the Murdoch Network. And then you look at the heads of the great universities, the schools and so forth. It doesn't take uh, a lot of people to really uh, control the masses if they're at the heads of these kinds of organizations. I believe that economics ultimately will be the number one way in which the emerging world government will try to control people. Um, if you can control a person's ability to buy or sell, you can run their life. Uh, if you have a single currency over the whole world or currency system, it provides no other alternatives or options. Back in 1968, George Ball was the Under Secretary for Economic Affairs with, uh, uh, with JFK and Johnson. At the meeting in Montreal in Canada, in Quebec, he said, uh, how can we create corporations that shall one day give orders to governments? And that's what Bilderberg is all about. It's not one world order, it's one world company limited. Highly organized uh, uh, agenda to break the back of the American free enterprise system because it stands in the way of uh, those that have a globalist agenda. And uh, so, and they're succeeding. And so the, uh, backed by big money, backed by the trade unions, backed by the multinational corporations, they're all playing that game for their own reasons. Increasingly, our utilities are under the influence of people from other parts of the world and other governments. Most of our main industries are now a majority foreign owned. Few Americans have any idea of this. And the powers that, the, uh, that own our major industries, for the most part, favor globalization and world government. So they are, I would say, a, a big part of, of this um, uh, drift toward world government. The main event is the, the wholesale destruction of, uh, of the world economy. Are you saying to me that Joel the Plumber is more intelligent than David Rockefeller? If he's lending the money, the question is why? So you destroy the economy and you destroy the wealth of the people because, again, uh, you destroy the wealth of the people, you destroy the power of, 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 of growth of nations and, of course, the population base. I believe we are just one major world crisis away from having a totalitarian type of system in place. Um, our indebtedness here in the United States is now approximately $65 trillion in foreign obligations. It's way beyond what most people realize. It can never be repaid. And because the United States has presented a, a, a specific challenge to globalists, uh, because the American people have always been an independent, freedom-loving people, so how do you get the United States into a global government? Well, ultimately, you have to crash their economy and make them so dependent on foreign powers that you can blackmail them to come into a system. The, the thing about this is you have to you have to have a crisis big enough for the public to be able to uh, accept whatever the solution is. It, you know, it can't be a half a big crisis. It's like Rahm Emanuel said a few months back. You know, the last thing you want to waste is a good crisis. Every time we turn around, there's a new crisis. There's an economic crisis. There's a war crisis. There may be a pandemic crisis. There's a crisis everywhere you look. And as long as people are in this crisis mode, uh, they're not very uh, vigilant about uh, watching what's happening to their liberties. Uh, all they're thinking about is, oh, government, do something, protect me, save us from all of this. And the government says, yes, that's exactly what we intend to do. Every time there's a new war or a threat of war, there's more motion in the direction of merging our military with other national military forces through the United Nations, so-called peacekeeping forces. So all of these crises lead to more legislation, more treaties, uh, and a more uh, movement in the direction of giving up our sovereignty as a nation, merging with a global structure, and the creation of that global structure into a totalitarian system. Thanks again for coming down, Mr. Wilson. I know you're a busy man, so we'll try and keep this short. Come on and have a seat. So, for the record, your name is John Francis Wilson, and you live at 15 Clear Heights Drive. I'm, so, I'm sorry, could you clearly reply yes or no to my questions? Yes, I am John Wilson. Is this being recorded? Are you a member of the Church of God on Springer Avenue? Yes. Have you taken part in their pro-life meetings and marches? Uh, well, yes, but what does this have to do? Plan on attending this evening's meetings with this group? Yes. 
Mr. Wilson, are you aware that it is legal in this country to have an abortion? Well, yes, but it hasn't always been that way. Are you aware that some health care providers have been attacked and murdered by members of groups like yours? Hold on. Uh, we have nothing to do with those groups. We are peaceful people that are, are protesting. Are you aware that some health care providers have been attacked, Mr. Wilson? We believe in preserving life and not taking it. Are you aware, Mr. Wilson, yes or no? You are a member of three different Right to Life groups. You are a member of a number of evangelical Christian organizations. You've donated money to Christian Science Research and the Salvation Army. You receive daily emails from radical organizations that encourage prayer for our government on matters of policy. You signed a number of petitions supporting the traditional definition of marriage. You frequently visit websites that are pro-Israeli and others that believe in an imminent cataclysmic event. Your wife and children are also enrolled in or are talking to many other radical anti-social organizations and people. Mr. Wilson, there's a lot more here. Are these the actions of a peaceful man and his family. I'm terrified by that thought. A global government, that would mean that, that the franchise we have for freedom and for allowing everybody to vote would be destroyed. The uh, ability for uh, our people to accept uh, the Bill of Rights and all the freedoms guaranteed in the Bill of Rights would be destroyed because we, the rest of the world doesn't have the free press like we have. And women don't vote in most of the countries in the rest of the world. Uh, you don't have a society in Japan, you're guilty until proven innocent. Uh, you don't have the right to protect yourself in your own home uh, or even defend yourself against violent criminals in Great Britain. All those freedoms that we have today would be taken away from us. So all that a world government can do would mean that the wrong people would vote on what's right for America. Why not have the people of the world living in, in unity, peace, and harmony? On the surface, it sounds good. But as you get deeper into the organizations pushing this agenda and look at where these people are coming from in the higher levels, um, it is a very sinister uh, agenda. There's a lot of hatred for Christians and Jews. Read the Koran. If a woman commits adultery, she's stoned to death. If a thief steals something, he has his hand come on, can't be cut off. There is no ability for the compassion of Christianity to exist and make us a kinder world with either Muslim extremists, communists, or dictators. And if we had a world government, all of those thoughts, beliefs, and concepts would have to be represented, including atheism. And there are a tremendous number of people in the world who believe that not only abortion is correct, but you should be able to terminate a life up to two years uh, uh, if something's wrong with the child. Uh, there are too many different opinions that are evil for us to have a world government that's harmonious unless we give up so much of what we believe in. You need to understand that the United Nations Charter is not based on the Constitution of the United States, sadly. In order to understand that, you need to know that First, the, the Constitution of the United States, uh, our freedoms come from God. They are not able to be numbered. They are inalienable. They can never be taken away. When you take a look at the UN Charter, our rights come from government, they are numbered, and they can be taken away for bad behavior. If a one world occult system comes into place, I believe we will entirely lose our freedoms to, to speak out uh, to worship freely as we will, um, to own property as we do now, um, 
I believe much of the world's property will be seized by the coming global government in the name of protecting the environment. Um, our health care system, if someone controls uh, our health care, to a large extent they can control us. They can determine whether you live or die. Not only is it a tyrannical form of government, but it's built around the assumption that this is all for the greater good of the greater number. So the people at the bottom who are being told what to do are educated or propagandized or whatever you want to call it to believe that after all this is in their own best interest. A world government could actually dictate to a farmer what he has to grow or maybe to get off of his land entirely and move somewhere else in order to save the environment. Maybe his piece of land will be designated special environmental property under the United Nations. Uh, that has already happened with some of our national parks and I've seen a map that shows that ultimately as much as a third of the United States could be declared as one world property where people wouldn't have any access to it at all. You're talking about the World Wildlife Fund. Their main objective is again to reduce the world's population. Prince Philip, uh, Queen Elizabeth II's husband, he said that. He said if I ever came back, you know, reincarnated, I come back as a deadly virus. Well, of course he would because that's what these people are into, into destroying the world society. Now that's how one can begin to understand the real goals of the Agenda 21 Sustainable Development UN Global Plan. You see, that plan in, in its own expression calls for a reduction of the human population by 85%. So you begin to wonder how it is we can survive in this country when our resources are taken and put off limits for our use, whether it's you know, mi mining resources or timber resources, um, food resources, etc. You know, if we were to remove half of this country's land mass from productive human use, it's only a matter of time before human population begins to fall. But when we understand that that's the plan of the United Nations, we can begin to put this in a perspective that we need to be putting it in. Maury Strong at the UN, you know, is like, he's a very altruistic guy. The guy thinks that, you know, he, he thinks that he's uh, doing the right thing for the most number of people by advocating that we kill off some of them because there's just too darn many of them. I believe the whole concept of, of population control and diminishing the world's population to a place where uh, we can sustain development uh, and bringing it below one billion is, is setting the stage for mass persecution down the road. What if people actually buy into that idea that much of the world has to be eliminated in order for those who are left to be able to continue to function? You're, you're going to see more wars, more famines, more disease, some of this intentionally spread to reduce the population of mankind. There's a place I visited uh, called the Georgia Guidestones where they present the Ten Commandments of the New Age Movement in a number of different languages. And one of the commandments calls for the reduction of the population of mankind down to a fraction of what it is right now. So a thinking, intelligent person should be asking, how are they going to achieve that? If that is one of their goals and they're going to work toward that goal, then who are the victims going to be and, and how are they going to choose who lives and dies? I find it hard to believe is because they don't hear it from any other source. Uh, you're not going to hear it in the media. You're not going to hear it from the government leaders. You're not going to hear it from the people who, in fact, are creating it. That's the thing. And so they don't realize how far it has gone. Well, people don't know much about sustainable development because major media is really captured by the same interests that uh, control the banking uh, institutions. Our public information systems have been bought up or have been taken control over by these um, forces that seek the creation of this one world uh, where human beings become chattel to the ruling elite. And it seems that there have been plenty of people signing up to become slave masters and keep this information uh, un undercover. Now, the loss of freedom is not being imposed on most people in the Western world, not being imposed by force of arms uh, with bayonets, guns, or bombs, but with propaganda. They've convinced us that what's on the cover of the New York Times, the Washington Post, the you know, Globe and Mail, the Toronto Star, or on CBC Nightly News with Peter Mansbridge, if he's still around or alive, you know, it has to be the truth. And everything else thus as a result is a conspiracy. Because if what I'm saying is the truth, it obviously would be on the front cover of the Toronto Star. Well, it can't, because the media forms part of the world elite. The purpose of a media in a democracy 
is to in inform the electorate. Their job is to be a watchdog on the government. Well, we have a media that's prostituted itself totally to an agenda. And, uh, and not only in terms of what it promotes, but in terms of what it hides. The real truth was hidden to the American people, still is. It's a, an incredibly well-organized propaganda machine. The umpires, they control people or they manipulate people by making sure they control how people think. And this is exactly what they've done so very, very well. Because again, the greatest hypnotist in the world is this oblong box everyone has in their living room called the television set, which has taught us to eat, to think, you know, to dress, to walk, to talk. We know more about the lives of, of Britney Spears than we know lives about our spouses. It's a gradual progression from well-intentioned people who simply want world peace to those that embrace pantheistic concepts and ultimately a small percentage of those that actually go on to worship Lucifer or Satan. Evil exists. And evil has been able to coordinate and combine its efforts to bring us to this point. When you look at how far we've already moved down that path, especially during the last 10 years or so, and when you look at, at how many top economic uh, planners in the world favor a one world economic system, and how various figures at the United Nations are calling for a one world political system, preferably from their standpoint through an empowerment of the United Nations to the point where it actually becomes a world government. And then on July 6th of, of 2009, uh, the Pope comes out and openly calls for the creation of a world political authority with teeth to be able to enforce itself. You begin to realize maybe we're closer to all of this than we imagine. I don't know how they knew all about us. Well, they did. No, I wasn't charged with anything. It's, it was a warning, though. Yeah, I don't, I know we can't. Listen, why don't you just come down here and we can talk about it, all right? I, I don't want to talk on the phone anymore. I know how crazy that sounds, all right? I love you. OK, bye. There is no question that we live in a surveillance society. There's no question that detailed profiles are being created and stored about each and every one of us. There's no question that this is only going to increase with every passing day and with every new technological advancement. There's no question that with every new threat, new crisis, and consolidation of world resources, knowledge, and currencies, our world moves closer to a one-world governmental system. This new system will not be a friend of Christianity or Judaism. Basic rights like the freedom of speech, the freedom of religion, and the freedom to own land will disappear. Already today, there are very powerful and influential people who have dedicated themselves to seeing this comes to pass. I have no doubt that it will and soon. Then why am I not afraid and running for the hills? Because I knew this would happen. Incredibly, it was prophesied over 2,000 years ago. I'm so tired of people saying, you can't prove the Bible. Yes, you can. If you, if you take the trouble to discover that of the integrity of its design, and then that design had to originate from outside time because it writes history before it happens and with the precision that's staggering. And the more you know about your Bible and the more you know about what's going on in the geopolitical or just the world arena, the more you see a convergence approaching the classic biblical scenarios. The Bible says that in the last days, the government of the Antichrist rests on three pillars. The first is a global government, the second is a global, uh, global economy, but the third is a global religion. The people at the forefront of this one world movement, generally speaking, are extremely anti-Jewish and anti-Christian. And they want to bring together all the religions of the world and unify them for, for a specific purpose, which is to put a leadership figure in power that would rule the world. And the Bible warns us of these kinds of developments in the, in the last days. And this is a far cry from where we were in the 50s, 60s. Um, the uh, the anti-Christian atmosphere uh, in the fact that uh, you're worried about having the Ten Commandments in our courtrooms and all of that, uh, you begin to realize is evaporating very, very quickly. What most people don't realize, your freedoms will evaporate with that. There are so many signs today that indicate that we are living in the last days. Uh, the Bible has so many prophecies warning us, giving, a, and giving us an idea uh, of this time getting closer so that those of us who are alive when all of this happens could be forewarned and prepared. And um, one of those, the biggest perhaps, is Israel. The coming together 
out of over 100 countries from around the world of nearly 7 million Jews returning back to Israel after 2,000 years. Uh, that's incredible. Uh, some people try to say it's just a big coincidence or part of a different agenda. Um, but when you look at scripture and over 50 different prophecies in the Old Testament, uh, foretelling that in the last days, God would regather the Jews from the four corners of the earth, from one side of the world to the other, all bringing them back to Israel. It's really difficult to try to explain that away. Ezekiel wrote about the restoration of Israel and said that in the latter days it would, that uh, they would be restored on exactly the same piece of real estate from which they'd been scattered. Zephaniah said they would uh, return with a pure language, restored Hebrew, which was restored by Ben Yehuda in 1948. Hebrew is a working language of Israel today and it was dead before Latin was developed. Along with that, in the book of Daniel, uh, we are told that there would be a massive increase in knowledge. Well, the last I heard, knowledge was doubling now every four years. That's never happened before in world history. Uh, and that is bringing the world closer and closer together. Um, technologically, things are now possible. You can talk on, on the telephone with someone halfway around the world, and it sounds as if they're next door. Uh, travel has uh, become so much easier, and communication through the internet. All of these things have worked to make the world smaller and, which brings me to my next point, to make global government possible, uh, which in Revelation 13 and 14, uh, we are warned of such a global system that would exist in the last days, a type of uh, one world uh, political system that would use its economic and military power to enforce religious worship. It wasn't even conceivable 1900 years ago where any single individual could have such minute and centralized control of, of the economy that nobody could buy or sell unless they were part of a particular system. That was never possible. This is exactly what John saw though. And he saw it in the context of a developing global government. It's in the context of the fact that the Antichrist government, its strong suit is deception, its power comes from its control of the economy, and its uh, ultimate goal is worship of the leader. It's, it's the ultimate fascist state. I believe when the mark will first be introduced, there will be an attempt to make it seem very fashionable, um, a, a safety uh, mechanism. If, if you're kidnapped, uh, police would know where you are and could rescue. Uh, that's already happening right now uh, with, with animals, uh, but also with humans in some parts of the world. What is Satan's primary weapon? All through the Bible, deception. That started in Genesis 3, all the way through. Every time Jesus talked about the end times, he opens and closes his discourse by saying, be not deceived. So that's our challenge. And uh, we are being deceived. We're being conned. In, in, in a local political sense, but also in a much broader sense. The Bible says that Peter was writing to Timothy, and he said that, you know, that in the last days, people will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Then they'll be turned unto fables because they want to hear what they want to hear, not what is necessarily true. You know, and, and, and we're, we're living in a generation now where truth is, uh, it, it, it has become, like, it's subjective. I mean, there, there can be two versions of the truth. Finally, in, in Matthew 24, Jesus warns us of an unprecedented deception that would take place at the very end of time, just preceding his second coming. Uh, specifically in verse 24, he says that even the elect could be deceived if that were possible. Now that's gotta be some kind of major deception for Jesus to make that type of statement. And we are seeing increased deception today, false religions uh, coming in and taking hold in the United States, where just a generation ago, most people would have professed uh, a belief in Christ, or at least their ethic would have been Christian-based. The culture we're in is a very strange one. It, it denies the existence of truth. Well, what's the purpose of a university? I thought it was to pursue truth. What's the purpose of our scientific establishment? Discover what's true. And we live in a culture which denies the existence of truth. Another sign is the increased depravity of man. And in First and Second Timothy, it talks about how in the last days man would become uh, more focused on self, a pursuer of, of pleasure, um, self-centered, boastful, proud, all of that. Um, we are seeing that today through the New Age movement in ways that we have never seen before. It's all about self. You literally have millions of people 
out there who believe that they are God. Um, we've never faced a situation like that before, but we do now. We're broke, we're admired in a global war, we're, you know, with the, we're in a religious war. It, you know, it's, uh, we're, everything seems to be, we're in decline. They're talking about uh, getting rid of the U.S. dollar. Everything seems to point towards the U.S. no longer being the world's only superpower, which is exactly what the Bible said. You can see it all converging towards that. Um, so we could, we, could, we could make a list of, what's, of the, the, the main uh, countries in the Middle East and in Europe and the Far East. We can go through all that whole list. We can talk about technologies. We can make a whole list of, of trends. We, we classically, our, our uh, enterprises monitored a dozen of these. And the more you know about each one, and the more you know what the Bible says about each one, you see a convergence. It isn't one of them, it's all of them happening at the same time. And verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. That's part of the Olivet Discourse, but I mean, it, it, it makes Israel the benchmark. You know, it's, it's the, the, the time clock, it's the stopwatch. Once it starts clicking, we've got one generation left, and we're very close to the end of that now. My challenge to anyone that, that to which these things are fresh and new and unknown is to find out yourself, not what Chuck Missler or somebody on the radio or TV says. Find out yourself what the Bible really says. The Bible says that the heavens and earth proclaim the very existence and majesty of God our Creator. That same Creator gave us a book to share His thoughts and plans for our lives. Unlike any other book in all of history, it also predicts what's going to happen in the future the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the return of Israel to her land in 1948, our remarkable changing world today. If someone you knew could predict the future with 100% accuracy, wouldn't you listen to them? Well, the Bible does exactly that, and it predicts that Jesus Christ will return for his followers and take them to a wonderful eternal home. Whether you're around for that event or whether you pass on before that, I pray that you will accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today. You may not be able to control what happens to your nation or our world, but you can determine your eternal destiny. The Bible says that tomorrow is promised to no one. Make the most important decision of your life and trust that Jesus loves you and wants to be part of your life. Our research into surveillance practices, losses of freedom, and shadow governments is not meant to scare you. It's meant to open your eyes to the shifting world around us. It's meant to shine a light on God's incredible prophecies. It's meant to bring you closer to our eternal Savior, Jesus Christ. What's going to happen a month from now, a year from now, 10 years from now, how do we prepare for it? And the one thing that the Lord over and over impresses on my heart is the importance of staying close to Him and taking it one day at a time and keeping our eyes focused on eternity.